Yes, sir. <laughs> Anything else I can help out with? Where to go? Well, it's a great pleasure and privilege to introduce another genuine pioneer, another person who has really helped shape our field in a multiplicity of ways. Bob Kahn was primarily responsible for the design of the ARPANET, which was the first practical realization of packet switching, which was rather a controversial thing at the time people first started uh, advocating it. He was also responsible for initiating the Internet project at ARPA, which was the follow-on to ARPANET. And that was the first open architecture network, another very important idea. He's a co-inventor of the TCP IP protocol, which provides the framework for the Internet. Now, that's one role in which he functioned as key designer, scientist, engineer. Another was that he was an enlightened funder of the ARPA academic community. And he was responsible for initiating and funding many star projects and stars, and we're all in his debt. He's been a tireless champion of computers and communications and that interplay that is so important to us today. He left ARPA for a very specific purpose to found, and he is now president of, the Corporation for National Research Initiatives, which he founded in 86 to provide leadership for the research and development that he felt would absolutely be vital for the National Information Infrastructure, the NII, or as it became later known, the Information Superhighway or the Infoban, or whatever your favorite buzzword is, that that would take in order to be more than just hype, to be reality and to be useful to all of us. And he is still engaged in working those research issues. Now bringing it back to our theme today, Bush had very little to say about how people work together. The idea of sharing, or as Ted now says, transclusion, was certainly in there, but it is almost hidden away. And you really had the sense that he was wor working on personal information management devices. But sharing information is obviously the name of the game today. And spools of annotated microfilm in the mail is not how we fortunately have to do things today. He simply did not anticipate computers and communications as it has grown up. And Bob's role here today will be to talk about ways in which to extend Bush's vision. Bob? Well, let's see. Would you have any serious objections if I took your laptop off of the podium here? urge to press on these keys. Just can't resist a keyboard. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, I, I'm delighted to be here at this uh, um, session honoring the 50 years of uh, Bush's paper. Um, and uh, particularly uh, happy to uh, be on the, the program after both uh, Ted Nelson and Doug Engelbart. I have to tell you, though, that uh, uh, I think uh, it would have been much nicer if you put them on in the reverse order, because uh, every time I listen to Doug, I feel nice and smooth and relaxed, and when I hear Ted, I feel like I need to lie down. <laughs> You know, just, you know, Doug reminds me of kind of a cyber psychologist. I always feel like sort of probing, and every time I listen to Ted, it's sort of a hybrid. I keep going back and forth between Back to the Future and Saturday Night Live. Um, when, uh, when I was asked to give this talk, um, uh, Andy uh, sort of said, uh, look, anything you'd like to talk about would be would be fine as long as it's in the context of, uh, of Bush's paper, because that's what the symposium is about. And I got to thinking about the, the real guidance I got, because um, I mean, listening to both Doug's uh, talk and Ted's talk, uh, I sort of got the impression that the guidance from uh, Andy to Doug may have been to only talk about ideas that have been well thought about for the last 40 years, and which of course Doug has been doing over and over again. And in listening to Ted, I sort of had the impression that he said, don't talk about any idea that you've had in the last 35 years. Um, so focus only on 
on, on stuff that hasn't evolved since then. To me, um, when I first suggested, uh, well, what, what about the uh, internet, and I uh, can talk a little bit about packet switching, he says, no, no, that's sort of retrograde stuff. Talk about the future. Uh, sort of look, at, look, look into what the future is likely to produce. And I said, well, then how about uh, something about the framework for digital object services, which is sort of where things are currently at in my way of thinking. He says, no, that sounds too much like a computer science uh, seminar. I really want you to sort of speculate about the future, which I translated to mean, don't talk about any idea that you've ever thought about before you show up on this podium. <laughs> and uh, that's been a little bit hard to do. So. I, I probably won't keep to the letter of that uh, particular guidance, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, let's see, when, when you look at the paper that uh, Bush wrote, and uh, I've read it now many, many times, and on the one hand, it, it really is very prescient about so some of the needs and requirements and desires and ideals that we might have in the future. Um, I, I'm particularly impressed about his notion of what reality is. I mean, his reality is totally embedded in the inventions of the day or the near term. He talks a lot about photocells and advanced photography. He talks about thermionic tubes. Uh, you know, he talks about typewriters. He's sort of locked into the, uh, the, the stuff of the day, as it were. Um, he certainly doesn't talk about digital technology, and I want to get into that uh, in the future. Um, he has a very strong focus in his particular um, uh, writing on scientists and sort of what's left for the scientific community to focus on. Uh, he certainly has pointed to the information overload problem, which certainly must be greater now than it was then, but it's nice to know that it's not a new problem. Uh, at least it gives us some hope if we haven't solved it in the last 50 years. Uh, we have some work to do in the next 50. He talked a lot about uh, sort of linking of ideas, but when you looked at the machinery that he was talking about dealing with it, it tended to be more grounded in logic than it was in higher level notions, um, more semantic context, and perhaps he really believed that some somehow higher level ideas could be put into the context of, of logic, as many people have proposed on certain axiomatic bases. And he I think emphasized very strongly the human dimension uh, as he got into the notion of mimics and where it could, uh, could lead through some of his ideas like trails and so forth. Um, but as I look at what he wrote about in the paper, I, I'm also struck by what it was lacking as well as what it was prognosticating upon. It was really very strongly lacking in um, digital technology, and we heard even from some of the members of the audience uh, that uh, you know perhaps he was not all that comfortable with digital technology because it really kind of arose uh, from around him but not from within him personally. Uh, it's interesting also that the paper was dated uh, in, in the year in which, uh, or certainly in the decade in which computing first uh, really emerged as a, as a workable invention. Not to say that people hadn't thought about it before and hadn't poked around with it, but I think the 40s was really the year of the early workable machines, and the 50s the first really practical ones, and then after that it really got commercialized seriously. Um, he was also therefore um, embedded in a world of analog devices. Um, he was focused on where the science community went, and of course he was also well grounded in the physics community of the day, which at the end of World War II uh, saw its mission coming to, uh, to an end, uh, potentially. I think we have some of the same similarities today, but a very different possible rollout. Um, you know, just as the end of World War II offered serious questions and challenges for the scientific community, so too today does the end of the Cold War offer some serious uh, challenges for the entire scientific research community in this country because we have come to the end of what's been a very long 50-year compact between um, the federal government and the research community in the sense that 
a lot of the research that was supported over that period was predicated on the need to do it because of the Cold War. And while that's by no means a suggestion that uh, the federal government won't continue uh, a compact with the research community, it's pretty clear to me that it's being reformulated as we speak. And nobody yet knows what the shape and form of it is. I'm particularly hopeful that it will come out with as strong support as we've had in the past, but it's by no means guaranteed. So there are some parallels between what we've seen in the past and what we're, we're seeing now. Uh, the fortunate thing uh, in, in Vannevar Bush's time was the fact that uh, he had this, this future that was unveiling itself as he was writing his work. Um, today, you could say that some of the same is happening. I could argue that uh, we have not yet really seen the innovation that's going to really change the world of the future. Maybe we have it in our heads and it hasn't come out, or maybe it's happening around us and some of us don't know about it. Um, the absence of digital technology in his vision, it seems to me, led to a very limited view of what was doable and what was not doable. Um, in the in 1972, uh, when I played at the very first ICCC conference, a tape about the ARPANET and the origins of packet switching, uh, a lot of the people who were very active and have stayed active in the field were, were on that tape. And uh, had we done a retrospective, I would have played it for you here today in part. Uh, if you listen to that tape, what you will hear is that the communication folks speak in very timeless phrases. They talk about the need for connectivity, high bandwidth, highly reliable systems. And you could play it today and say it's today's challenge just as well. When you listen to the folks who are more grounded on the computer side of the world, and I think the distinction was larger then than it is today, um, almost everyone was talking about the technology of the day. And so almost nothing that they said really translates easily into today's context because it's dated. So you would see people talking about the need to connect uh, a high power graphics display to a powerful remote time sharing system as their aspiration for the future. Today, nobody would argue that. Nobody talked about uh, much of the technology that's shown up because it just didn't exist. They talked about better use of the technology they then, then had, but they were very clear about the role of software in this, in this whole thing. Well, um, where are, are we today? I say still in a very embryonic state. Uh, we are rapidly converting to digital, but lest you think that we've made a lot of progress to date, we are barely there. Today, uh, if you can imagine a not too distant future when we might have, uh, let's say, upwards of 60 million people on the internet, keep in mind that that's likely to be less than one-tenth of one percent of the world's population. So that um, the actual size of the uh, the population that we're, or maybe it's one percent, but the size of the population that we have to deal with is much, much larger than uh, people who are now experiencing this particular uh, technology. And as the technology gets out, uh, the biggest problem I think we're going to have to deal with is the cultural distinctions between the network itself and what it implies and the physical reality that we all deal with on a daily basis. So let me separate these, these two things and talk about the physical reality and the network and give you some notion of the kind of cultural disparity that exists between these two worlds. Now, I mean, I've experienced it myself in a number of different contexts. Um, it's come up in some of the dealings with the financial community when they have largely in the past, and most people think about using networks as a vehicle for moving information about money. What they don't realize is that you can also have a notion of money that exists wholly within the network itself, has no necessary physical counterpart on the outside. So you open up your wallet, you take out a string of bits, you hand it to somebody else, and you've done the same thing as take out a dollar bill and hand it to them. That is, there need be no physical account anywhere else in the world that knows about 
that dollar bill or knows about these bits, uh, and yet you can pass them around, maybe even make change for them. Well, when you describe that to people who are somewhat sophisticated about digital technology, the very first thing they think about is you must mean passing information about it no matter what words you use. It's very hard to, uh, uh, to think about anything else. Second example I would give you is in the working that we've done with the library community, where the library community traditionally has been very paper-based. They deal with books. They deal with uh, stacks of material. And their notion of the network is it's a way of taking that paper world and dealing with that information in a more flexible, um, flexible way. And so what they tend to do is take their thoughts and their uh, their approaches that were well developed in the, in the paper world and try and bring them into the world of, of the network, oftentimes at the, uh, at the loss of all the new flexibility that you could get if you rethought it completely. Anyone who has ever tried to take a book and put a book on the network in anything more than just showing the pages one after another or letting you move through them more flexibly, you know, realizes that the design of something for the network world can be a very different, different challenge than the design of something for the paper world. And I'm not talking about just the ability to do hypertext linking and things like that. The very nature of that experience can be very different. Uh, so the heart of the problem, as I see it in this particular cultural context, is getting people to understand that when you're in the network, um, you may be having a different experience than when you're outside. And so there's the whole idea of where you're grounded. When you're grounded in reality, the network is a tool. When you're grounded in the network, then sort of reality becomes your tool, as it were. You sort of have things flip around completely. So this shows up in a number of different domains, but let me just uh, start out by um, talking about uh, um, creativity in the digital world, for starters. Um, people that we deal with in the uh, various uh, industries that are content-oriented today know that when they produce uh, uh, you know, a work in paper form or they record something, it has a reality in the physical world, and when it gets translated into the digital world, uh, they want to think of it as being the same thing. A lot of laws that apply in the physical world that they'd like to apply in the electronic world. And maybe that's the right way for it to come out politically. It doesn't have to come out that way technologically. There are people who can create things in the digital world. That is to say, if you are a creator of a musical work, there's no need to necessarily for that work to first show up in audio recorded form before it ever gets transduced into any way that's captured and stored in memory. That is, you can create it totally in digital form without anybody ever having heard it before. And in that sense, it's got different properties than it might if it were in the normal analog physical world. The act of converting something from the physical world to the digital world is to some a trivial mechanical contrivance. It's just a matter of scanning some bits, digitizing some bits. But what you end up with is something that is uniquely different in many ways. It's manipulable in different ways. It's processable. It's transportable. There are things that you can potentially do with it. And in fact, it may be a very new contrivance all, all on its own. You know, I'm reminded of the discussions that I've had um, with my wife, who happens to be a copyright lawyer, about the history of some of the key uh, developments in this field. And uh, you know, I was particularly struck with how difficult it was to get people to realize that a motion picture was really a different kind of thing than just a series of images. And yet, while in this country we recognize the existence of the motion pictures, uh, an audiovisual work of a different kind than just a collection of images, uh, because it does have a storyline and it does convey a different experience, there are countries around the world for which motion pictures are protected as just a very long series of images, and there is no other attribution given to them beyond that. So one of the hypotheses I want to put out is that, in general, this may not be the true in every single case, and this is certainly not a statement about how law should be written, 
But the fact of the matter is that digital representations of things are in fact literary works. They are putting together things in terms of sequences of symbols, which is what a literary work is. We tend to put them together as sequences of the alphabet, which are non-processable except by a human brain and, and system looking at it. You know, potentially English could be processable by a machine in the future according to some rules, but when you write computer programs and you're executing on digital representations, you in fact uh, are dealing with literary works in a program field according to my reading of the law today. Whether that is um, something that would be universally accepted or not is a different issue, but it seems to be the case. Now when you talk about a digital representation, the interesting word there is not so much digital but representation because it implies that what you have inside the system is a representation of what was outside the system. And what do you do when you start out with something that's inside the system to begin with? Well, it's not clear it's a digital representation of anything else. It may be the, the, the first and only fixation. It may have an analog representation of the digital original, if you will, but it may not be a digital representation of something that was outside, like a digital representation of an image or a movie or uh, whatever. Furthermore, um, as we move to an all digital world, um, my assertion is that our grounding in reality is going to be lost in a very fundamental way in the sense that uh, as we get into more and more activities that involve multiple participants enabled through this digital medium, uh, everyone will be able to be involved in, participate, witness, view, experience a given event or set of events in their own unique way. And you might say we do that today all by ourselves, and uh, an arbitrary camera, though, could record the facts as they were. So the facts of the particular setting could be recorded on film, and we would say that was the reality. But in a digital space, maybe you can't get to a single place that was the thing that produced the experience that everybody had. And since they all saw it differently, um, Rashomon phenomena are likely to abound in multiple ways. So there may in fact be no real reality anymore, just multiple perceptions of the same thing coming together. Well, when you look at uh, Bush's notion and you realize that digital technology didn't fit in his world, um, you realize that he was pushing pretty hard and in a rather remarkable way to figure out how all these analog pieces of technology could play into this future. But when we look at it today, that range of technology almost is not on, on, the, on the visibility scene. We have semiconductors and electronics more generally. Uh, my guess is that in time, even that technology may be superseded by something else. I mean, we're all looking at uh, optics and photonics, uh, but that may not be the last word in terms of uh, materials and material phenomena. Um, in fact, as we move to faster and faster and smaller and smaller, uh, we're, we may get from uh, our current views where we're talking about moving things to actually manipulating things in smaller and smaller worlds as we get into the uh, ability to manipulate the, the nanoscopic and smaller. Uh, on the networking front, the issue is um, somewhat similar uh, in, to computing in the sense that I think computing as we know it as a machine that's able to manipulate symbols on our behalf will be around probably forever. Networking in terms of its ability to provide reliable connectivity between different parties will probably be around with us forever. I don't think those are likely to um, be, be um, taken for granted anytime soon. Maybe in the future it will. And so when you look at what is possible within uh, this framework, begin to realize that while many people are pushing the technologies and, and we get amazing developments uh, almost every, every year, in fact the real action is likely to be in the systems and the 
application side of the world where we try and put these things together in interesting ways that take real advantage of the power of the networking and the power of the computing capabilities, both the equipment themselves and all of the peripheral devices that go along with it. Um, everybody here probably would view progress in networking in terms of a few simple measures like bandwidth, moving from 56 kilobits or 300 baud for those old timers uh, to one and a half megabits or a gigabit or a terabit or a petabit and I run out of Greek uh, prefixes at some point here. Um, somebody could probably help. Uh, on the computing side, uh, software is still too hard uh, but the real challenge is putting it together. It's the integration function uh, and as you think about the integration function, you realize that um, the idea of integration uh, ultimately has got to be more than just plug and play. Uh, that is, plug and play sort of presumes that somebody has figured out what the architecture is for coherence beforehand and put out this technology in a form that you can just plug it and things will work. But this is unlikely to be the way things actually work. It's unlikely to be the way things work at the technology level. It's unlikely to be the way things work at certain dimensions of the human interaction level. And it's unlikely to work that way at the content level. Now, if I could have the first uh, of the slides, I just want to give you the NII example of, of, of how this integration can and cannot play out. There are a lot of people who think that the NII, the so-called National Information Infrastructure, is a kind of thing that we need and we might consider putting out a, an RFP to somebody to go build it, like a building so it's got an architecture that's below it. But in fact, it's probably more organic than that. Uh, to really be effective, it needs to have the kind of dynamism that the economy might have where you can capitalize on ideas from different sources, put them together so that the whole is greater than just the sum of the parts. But this slide illustrates one model of an NII that might come out of our combined activities. But what is this? It's a very uninteresting notion of an NII. It is more like what we would define the economy to be, namely the set of all activities that are involved production and consumption, uh, social and otherwise in our system. Uh, here's the same thing for the NII. You simply take the collection of technologies and applications and all the things that people produce and all the things that people consume, put a circle around that and call that the NII. If that's what we end up with, um, we will have failed to leverage the real possibilities of this revolution in computers and communications that we're experiencing. The infrastructure is absolutely crucial uh, and the reason it's crucial is that if it's done right, it can lower the barriers to productivity in lots of different ways. You've heard some examples already from some of our speakers, but we haven't really had a national level infrastructure, uh, despite the fact that we've had a telephone system in this country for a long time. Uh, I heard one of my colleagues say this was a hundred year mistake in going from all digital technology and the telegraph to all analog technology and now back again, but that's another matter. Um, we may in fact go through this cycle again and again as we consider whether to move to an all optical plant which is not yet clearly digitized. So we may move back to an all optical one at some point in the future only to realize the power of digital technology in the network and then figure out how to gain the power of that through some physical uh, invention of which uh, I can barely begin to comprehend at this point. Uh, so you have uh, you have this, this conundrum. If I can have the next slide, this is sort of the dream that many people have, that you take all of these different um, capabilities that are going to be part of the NII and they go through a magic convergence process. Don't ask me what it is. Uh, I saw a wonderful uh, film on the notion which kind of made fun at, at, at this whole notion as to whether it's possible. but. I would, I would describe the first slide as being akin to putting out an RFP for a symphony asking for violin, oboe, first cello pieces and saying that they can be no more than 30 minutes in length and have a dynamic range of 60 dB. And then you take the, you, you take the ones that look nicest on the screen, you add them together and you call that your symphony. 
The problem is it's missing something, and I don't know what to call it exactly. It's not the architecture of the symphony, uh, but it is sort of the musical work that was presumably in the symphony in the first place. So you're not going to get that musical work by linear addition. It isn't going to happen, except unless the monkeys, enough monkeys submit uh, uh, musical compositions. So how is it going to happen? Well, one way it could happen is if, uh, you know, magically Mozart could uh, figure out what the NII symphonies are for each of these different areas and come out with the right prescriptions for what the oboes and the flutes and so on should be playing. But the NII is so big and broad that Mozart needs a pretty dynamic range to be able to cover all these bases. And I don't know anybody who's broad enough to cover absolutely every one of the bases. And maybe there are some who can cover some of them. But we don't even know what all the bases are. So how are we going to get to this convergence? And more importantly, how are we going to get anybody to agree to this notion of, of convergence? Uh, I think it's going to be very hard. I want to come back to this because the key to this working is is open architecture in my, po in my view. And it seems to me that the notion of open architecture is not necessarily something that is going to be unanimously agreed to a priori. We may agree to an open architecture a posteriori once all the standards and interfaces and the like are sort of sorted out in the marketplace. But if I can have the next slide, the more likely scenario is that we will have some degree of convergence in some limited domains initially, and that we'll have a lot of separate efforts by different groups, some with vertical integration and some not. And the sum of those two things, in fact, will be what we decide to call the NII. Now, uh, as, as you think about uh, the open architecture issue, um, let, let, me, let me try and describe this in um, in internet terms. When, when I was first working on the internet architecture, I described it to a large number of people as an open architecture approach to networking. Basically says, anybody can bring their own notion of a network, you can plug it together, and somehow the whole thing will seamlessly work to do best efforts delivery of uh, packets from source to destination. And it doesn't matter what the network technology is. Furthermore, you can have value-added service providers come and provide their own networks. In fact, the whole thing could be commercialized at some point and still allow for evolution of the technology. Well, in the early 70s, we had one large uh, communications company in this country, and the idea of them building an open architecture network for lots of other people to participate wasn't exactly in their game plan at the time. And in fact, I suspect, broadly speaking, even for people who would have been open to that idea, it didn't mean anything to them. They didn't know how to relate to it. I could see similar parallels to people trying to relate to hypertext when their only model of the world was a book. But when you're trying to relate to a network, you think about how you put it together. How's it going to work? Well, what's the issue here? Nobody's really in charge. The framework is responsible for keeping it working. There might be a process through which evolution can take place, but nobody really is running it. It just did have the ring of truth. Nothing this important to our society should be run that way, except the economy, maybe, <laughs> or a few other things like that. So it just didn't have the ring of truth back, back in those days to anybody. Didn't understand it. So where are we today to take the area of electronic transactions, which libraries will fall into, and electronic commerce would fall into it, all of those things. And you say, what we really need is an open architecture for digital libraries, let's say. And everybody says, yeah, that's fine. But then they glaze over because it doesn't mean anything to them. They don't know what does it mean. They say, well, it's really simple. You bring your own library to the thing, and it seamlessly becomes integrated in the whole say, yeah, great idea, and you go on to your next thing because it doesn't translate into a technological plan of action. And even if it did, it doesn't translate into a political, systematic, uh, commercial plan of action either. Uh, at least that's the way most people would look at it. So you go to someone who is in the database world and say, uh, this is what we want. They say, we have the answer. It's called distributed database technology. That's what it does. Except it's my distributed database technology. 
And you say, well, we want to take your distributed database technology and make that an open architecture. You say, wait a minute, that's where our value-added stuff comes in. And we can't possibly do that and, and make it available to anybody else. And I'm going to come back to this in the context of content in the middle because there's an analogous notion of an open architecture for dealing with content, but uh, let me do that in due course. So here you have this issue of open architecture, which I think is important, but you have to realize that, that there are many people in industry who would look at open architecture and say, that's what we get after the whole process of sorting out the marketplace is over. And if you try and do it up front, it precludes any single industrial giant who thinks they can do the whole vertical slice from weighing in and taking over the market. So some people think it's a good idea and some people think it's a bad idea, but I think it's the only way you can get this organic growth into a very large system where everybody has a chance to participate. Well, then you think about organic growth and that leads you immediately into issues of adaptability. If I could have the next slide, I've got some of these points I'm going to touch on outlined here. Um, Okay, so I've already talked about digital technology. And I'm going to come back to a couple of the points there, but I'm sort of jumping down right now into adaptive behavior. The, the most important thing you want in, in any system, and again, I'm thinking of network in the broad sense of including not only the communications and all the different pathways, but also the machines that may be connected to them. And when I talk about communications, I don't only mean terrestrial lines, I do mean wireless over the air, I do mean all of the different media that one might use in order to get information from one place to another, electronic, optic, or whatever. And I would even include in this open architecture the possibility of non-permanent connections so that people can, in fact, exit from the system and plug back in and still keep things going. So you'd like this kind of system to be able to adapt itself and ideally you'd like it to be able to adapt itself in some intelligent ways. How many of you know of any systems that really have a detailed awareness of what it is that they're doing? And the answer is almost none. I mean they might know for example in the phone company how much loading is on their lines or they may keep some traffic statistics but in terms of what's really going on they really don't have, have a notion nor any idea of how they can then configure the net to do a better job of uh, dealing with this. Uh, to give you an example of how you could get a better idea of awareness or even learning, let me hypothesize that in the world of the future, which might lead to very, very complex functionality or might not, that individual components in the net may have the ability to know what it is that's going on. A, a given wafer, for example, might no longer be just a set of electronics carrying out a function, but could in fact be multiple levels where level one in one example might be carrying out the function, level two might be overseeing the function carried out by the other level. Now if something goes wrong at one level, the other one might know about it, may be able to fix it and so forth. Um, likewise, you could have synergistic implementations where both levels are produ providing functionality and also at the same time keeping track of the others, and that's only a two level model. Uh, you can have trivial models that have more than two levels dealing with this replication and just checking to make sure how many are doing the same thing, but that's not really very smart. I think we can, we can do better than that. So I think the idea of incorporating adaptive behavior in the net uh, is, is an important one. Uh, another thing that becomes uh, uh, important, I'm going to come back to this later, is the possibility of injecting intelligence into the net. That is to say, today we're living in a world where everything that happens inside the system is principally controlled by the person who built it, brought it to you, runs it, operates it. There are very few cases where the I intrinsic operation of that system is allowed to be controlled by arbitrary people from outside, sending in the equivalent of, as it were, uh, intelligent uh, uh, agents in the system that could uh, affect its, its performance. This smacks to many people of uh, allowing viruses to come in. It, it, it raises all the issues of uh, trust and control. It raises all the issues of uh, uh, scoping and uh, and so forth, but it seems to me uh, it's in our it's in our future. Um, before I get off of this slide, let me jump up uh, a couple of levels and just touch on a few other points I didn't make on this slide. 
One is that um, Bush in his article talked a lot about capturing information from everywhere. I mean, he talked about, I don't know, walnuts on your forehead, or I forget exactly how he put it. Uh, microfilm, just sort of snapping pictures everywhere, you know, s hidden shutters in your pocket. The fact of the matter is we are rapidly getting to the point where every one of us can make digital fixations of everything that happens in our daily lives uh, cost effectively in the, not in the predictable future. And the real question is, what are we going to do with all of this information? We talk about information overload. This also becomes our intellectual property of very fundamental nature and raises some very profound social and cultural problems for the country. Every one of us has the potential for uh, other people wanting to see as much of this information as we're willing to make available. At some time in the not too distant future, there will be the first woman president of the United States. And that person may or may not be a little girl right now. And everything that goes on in that person's life may be of interest to the country as a whole, but you won't know about it until that event happens. And so it seems to me that if we were in that state, we ought to be making it possible to retain as much of this information as individuals are willing to allow to be retained, subject to their administrative controls, so that we do not lose our culture in the future. That's what I meant by digital fixations. Also, the ability to use this technology to, to allow collaboration and teamwork. I'm going to come back to this in, in, in a few minutes, but <clears throat> there is a very distinct difference in view of what networking can do depending on what business you're in. There's one, one view of the network as the medium for production and consumption of let me say information, maybe it's content. That is the idea, somebody produces something of value, the network is the delivery vehicle, somebody buys it, you pay for it, transaction is done. This is trying to simulate the buying and selling of the economy in the network environment. There's another model of the network where it's a medium for collaboration. It enables things to happen that couldn't otherwise happen, uh, for which there is no equivalent counterpart in, in speed and power in, in the physical world. And it seems to me that as we develop these ideas more fully, we're going to see these basic assumptions about what the network is having to come to the surface so that we can deal with them, both in law and in terms of um, uh, the, the whole evolution of these systems. Uh, in the notion of uh, in cyberspace that I mentioned earlier, I think it's going to be possible for all of us to actually have a digital presence in cyberspace. Today, almost all of us relate to it in one way or another. I mean, and that relationship is varying at different rates for many of us. You know, when I first started using the network in a serious way as a tool, I found myself initially going back to pencil and paper because I was comfortable in that mode, because using the machine I had to remember too many things, too many things could go wrong, I didn't either quite trust it or understand it. Well, I didn't feel relaxed enough to just relate to it in that mode. And then somewhere along the line, it just became the natural way to do things. And then the paper world became the, the arcane way. And for many people, I think they're going to discover a presence in cyberspace that's different from our current notion of just relating to it as a place where you go to pull things off a web or where you go to send a piece of email, but you actually have an existence there that's every bit as important in some ways as your existence outside of, of that space. On the area of open architecture, um, Again, the issue here is a very profound one for the scientific community because historically the development of, of science has been predicated on the notion of individuals doing the work and therefore publishing their work in a form that others can, can review it. But when you're trying to actually create infrastructure, oftentimes the full resolution of a problem in all its details is an inhibitor to getting other people to adopt it as the very fact that you stipulate an approach when there might be a thousand different approaches is an inhibitor rather than a solution for actually creating the infrastructure. It may be an interesting intellectual idea. It may be a contribution to knowledge, but it may be an inhibitor to the actual creation of infrastructure. So the hard part about infrastructure is excising all of the details for which there may be lots and lots of different 
and alternative approaches that are better than any single one that you might come up with or where you don't even know that the one that you have may be the best, allowing for people to participate in that process. Uh, if I can have the next slide. Okay. Um, I think the, the real issue in network enhancement is, one, what is the network itself? And number two, uh, what kind of functionality are we willing to allow others to stipulate for the network? Uh, in the case of, of almost every situation that I've dealt with, um, people have shied away from allowing other people to have a key part in describing functionality. They, they're willing to take inputs, but they're not willing to let them take actions that produce that functionality. And so I think this is going to be particularly interesting as we get into issues of learning in the network. Uh, and by learning, I don't necessarily mean that to have a scholarly notion, as one might normally attribute to that term, but rather ones that can incrementally update themselves, that can figure out what's going on, that can detect patterns of behavior, do things to improve things that, that can be... Uh, that can be codified in the form of computer programs that can cause specific actions to take place. That's what I mean by, by that term. Uh, let me go into this issue of um, this ubiquitous uh, content capture, uh, which I, I mentioned briefly before. Uh, if we have all of this information uh, that's around, and we have it all in digital form, uh, then we all become intellectual property purveyors in the most profound way. I suspect that a few of us in this audience have become aware of the value of intellectual property, either by virtue of their selling videotapes or by virtue of turning things into uh, uh, books for sale or what have you. But when you actually have all of this information about yourself, you don't know how much of it is going to have value. Therefore, you probably want to protect as much of it as you can from misuse by, by others. And this gets into a topic that I want to spend most of the rest of the, the time on, um, and that is the issue of malleability. Uh, once you've got a, a system that's capturing all of this information, it's going to be very easy to keep track of a variety of things. People have noted that in the past. Bush's paper was particularly cogent on this particular idea that you could settle things up, you could keep track of schedules, building links, and the digital technology makes that possible. This is one of the areas where I think the predictions are more likely uh, to come true, and they can be in various forms. They can deal with money resolutions, they can deal with logistics, your schedules, what have you. Uh, and furthermore, the technology is all going to probably become more integrated with us. I mean, I can see the day when, you know, the threads in my jacket will be mini antennas, and, you know, if you want to write on your display, you'll just make a little note in your, inside of your jacket pocket. And, uh, I mean, those notions of the wrist, whatever, probably will come true in some way, shape, or form, because that's just progress in technology. But if I can have the, uh, the next slide, I want to talk about this issue of... Um, Malleable content. This is actually a very fundamental kind of issue for anybody who has looked at the, uh, uh, the way copyright is handled today. You realize there are essentially two, these two distinct notions of the network. The network as the production consumption medium for content where the idea is that you can buy it, you can have it, you can use it for your own personal use, but you can't really change it. Now, there are people who are willing to uh, put material out for use on the net and are willing to allow people to, uh, to change it. And, and this is not to say that, that uh, much of today's technology can't be adapted to it, but the people for whom this is a business generally don't want that. And so this is what I would call hard copyright protection. The c extreme other side of the coin is what I call um, no fixation interchanges. I mean, this was the, the dilemma of the telephone versus the telegraph in the early days when people thought that, <coughs> you know, telephone wouldn't fly because it didn't give you any hard copy. And therefore, um, it, it was uh, viewed by some as not being that relevant, certainly for business transactions. Um, but the fact of the matter is that in between those two extremes where 
you know, in the case of a telephone call, there is no work. It's just an interaction between two parties that never gets fixed. And the other side where somebody actually creates something that they say, you can have, pay me, don't change it, there is a whole world in between, which I want to call the world of malleable content. And I think this is where the real ultimate value of the network is going to be played out because it's a world that we haven't experienced before in any real sense. Now, let me just say a little bit about what I mean by malleable content. What I don't mean is that you take somebody else's novel and completely change it or somebody else's treatise on a subject and, and create the inverse, uh, although it's possible to enable that to happen as well. What I really mean is where somebody can put out a piece of a work into the cyber world and as a result of that, other people can then build on that work in predictable ways where people get credit for what they've done and where the intent is to have other people to malleably manipulate that work. Now this can be done in a number of different ways, but you know, I'm, I'm particularly impressed, for example, in the discussions about education where you know, people think that the, the task of providing educational content is providing things on the screen that you can look at like papers in a, uh, from a book. Whereas, in fact, for kids to really find that interesting, they're going to have to interact with that medium in a way that's exciting to them, just like as if it were a non-fictional video game of some sort. So it's the interaction, the ability to cause something to happen as a result of an action that you've taken or a work that you've created that you add on to the other one. Uh, it's possible that as we develop knowledge structures for uh, for use in various uh, areas as time goes on, that people who develop new knowledge in those areas can add that knowledge to existing bodies of knowledge, therefore making the knowledge malleable with time as we learn more about it. The interesting thing about that is if somebody adds some piece of knowledge which makes another body of knowledge much more valuable, it, it may be that the real contribution has no meaning whatsoever without the previous body of knowledge that came before it. And so you can't really package them and sell them separately. They are intricately in, entwined. Um, this is not to say that we haven't had experience with this kind of thing, but generally the experience that we have had is where people have put out works of software, literary works of software, and I don't mean that necessarily as words, but I mean symbols uh, in, in digital form, where the intent is for other people to use them and build on top of them. They may have certain structures that not, don't let you get into the innards of them, like operating systems that you can't change but you can use, you know, or the programs that have the same or similar form. But it seems to me this whole idea of creating malleable content out in the net is the, the thing that's going to make this whole field really take off because it empowers people to become part of the process and contribute. To do that, I think we need to back away from some of our current economic notions of how to pay for this because if the real value of downstream contributions depends upon licensing at all stages of the game, it's probably going to die in, in legal contracting um, world in, in cyberspace. The fact of the matter is that we ought to have a mechanism <coughs> whereby the action of a 28-year-old in Singapore need not bring down an enterprise just because they've distributed something. In fact, if 40 million or 400 million people actually uh, put their hands on this material, it ought to be that the party who generated in the first place is reimbursed more significantly for having done that. So I'd, li I'd like to see that happen. Um, in the context of the, uh, the last two slides, uh, I think the whole idea of putting intelligence in the net is going to depend upon getting standard interfaces into these nets. I, I foresee a day <coughs> when, in fact, we literally will have a single means of interfacing, one standard interface uh, that lets all of the functionality of that interface be reflected in the object that passes through it. So that the issues of plugging and the issues of whatever are really grounded uh, more in um, the fundamentals of what you're trying to achieve at the systems level than they are at the physical hardware or subsystems level. Uh, if we can do that, then I think it allows us to deal with uh, entities that can move around fairly dynamically, uh, can use different languages, can do translation, because people can inject into the systems the interfaces that are needed to make this all work. Now, we may not call that intelligence in the sense of you know, traditional definitions, but I think it makes these networks 
more malleable in their own right and more functional in their own right in ways that uh, uh, we can all benefit from. Finally, let me just say a few words about notions of compl really complex systems, which is sort of where we're moving toward. Um, I think that uh, it is going to be the case uh, before too long, if it isn't already, where no I single individual really has any notion of the size or scope of what's really out there, what's connected to what, how anything is working anymore. Just notions of the base that you're building on and how to add new functionality into it. And I think that as a result of that, we're going to have some serious concerns about security. We're going to have some serious concerns about performance and functionality. And in fact, systems collapsing of their own weight without any notion of understanding sort of where the weight distribution is in these complex systems. So I think we're going to need, as part of this uh, matter of developing this intelligence in the net, ways for these systems to describe what they're about so that people can ask them and those systems can then tell you what they're about, how they're structured, where their strong points and weak points are, and so that we have a better idea from the systems themselves as to what's actually going on. Uh, there was a fellow that I used to work for who uh, I think was the last person who actually knew all of the detailed implementation in the Bell system. And when he retired, he said his fear was that the whole thing would, you know, possibly collapse if nobody else uh, could really, you know, keep their, keep the whole thing in their head. But of course, that really didn't happen as a technology thing. It happened as a, a political thing. And that's probably the more likely event here. That is, we'll get to the point where the systems, in fact, can explain all of this stuff, but it'll be so complicated for people to then understand it that they'll decide that we need to rebuild, remodularize, and somehow restructure just so that they can better understand it. So the ultimate challenge, I think, for us is to have people understand what's happening who are not technologists, but who are either users of these systems or ones who depend upon it in some fundamental way. Uh, I am sure that uh, if Bush had lived in a different world and he had different technology, he would have envisioned a lot of these things. These are not unique ideas. These are not things that uh, um, would have been terribly surprising to him. It's just that when you're a very practical person, as I suspect uh, Benavar Bush was, that uh, he tended to rely on what was then and what he could see in the likely, in the likely prognosis for the near term. And in closing, I would just point out that uh, you know it's very uh, it's very interesting to me to observe how, in the short term, almost everyone I know is more optimistic about what's going to happen than really does. But in the long term, we're all much more conservative about what's going to happen than really does. And I think this is uh, you know somehow related to that old adage that uh, you know if you uh, lose a little on each piece and sell it in quantity, you'll make it up in volume. So just how that happens or why it happens, I do not know. But it is a very strong curiosity of our field that we are way over expected in the short term and way under uh, predictive in the, in the long term. Thank you very much. In your um, uh, your sole evaluation criteria in your presentation was bandwidth. And uh, I wish I could afford to have that perspective, but, but my perspective has to factor in cost. And I think that's borne out by the fact that you said that only um, well maybe 60 million people are on the internet worldwide, and that's 1% of the world population, whatever, whatever. Uh, there are people like John Perry Barlow who want to uh, basically climb into their computers and live in cyberspace. And as, as this world that we're building becomes more attractive to the people who are there, uh, the tendency for those guys to do that probably will increase. And so what I'd like you to comment on is what's it going to take in terms of cost drivers to get the 60 million to turn into 600 million or a billion uh, before we end up with the interesting societal pressures of the, the network haves and the network have-nots? Um. I mean, I certainly do, do not <coughs> use this as, as the only metric of networking bandwidth or even connection bandwidth. Uh, I was giving that as an example how some people measure, you know, progress in, in networking, and clearly their progress is a function of cost and their, their ability to afford that. Um, I think that um, we are going to have to move to a <coughs> service-based notion of pricing 
before this will ever happen because as long as the vested interests are focused on existing revenue streams, you don't want to do anything to jeopardize that. I mean, the, the thing that has been so um, profound, in my view, about um, this technology development, uh, and I guess you could say it for others that have the similar characteristic, is that uh, they're often brought to you by the antithesis of the folks you would think would bring it to you because it really is challenging the status quo in many ways. Um, John Mayo gave a, one of the keynote addresses at the National Academy meeting in Washington last year, and he said it's a, it's a true revolution in the telecommunications industry, and it's only recently been realized. And somehow this, this notion of the Internet has sort of grown up around all of these companies. They don't quite know how it got there or what happened, but it developed around them and now they're trying to adapt to it. And my guess is that if they're at all smart, they will try and be the provider of the service for it. It wasn't something they had projected in the first place because no one of them would have probably taken the lead in building such an open architecture system. If there are people who can in fact afford to provide connections at low enough price, then my guess is you will see them doing that only because it's their way of getting a leg up in a field that they otherwise couldn't compete for and they will force other people to have to deal with them. And once you get the cost of this down to the commodities level, it becomes very hard for third party folks to get in, but then you're dealing with base costs that are probably, you know, about as low as they're going to get. Um, my expectation is that what we're, we're going to see is the tall pole in the tent grow taller. That is to say, uh, we'll have more fabric on the tent and you'll have a bigger base and you'll have a higher tall pole, which means that the people who are working at the forefront will be further removed from the people who are at the base and that you'll have lots more people at each of the levels and that people will in fact migrate from capability to capability as they change jobs, as companies decide to make bigger investments uh, and that uh, we will forever have a uh, kind of a schism of capabilities as people choose to buy more and more capability as they can as they can afford it, but that the price for getting in at the low level will be reasonably affordable. This is a topic that uh, we've dealt with on the President's Advisory Committee a lot, universal access, uh, not necessarily universal service, uh, and I know it's a topic that's been uh, written about fairly extensively, if for those of you who've looked at the black and white creatures in, in Snow Crash would, would know. Okay. Uh, let me uh, question your notion about putting intelligence in the network. Uh, isn't one, of, and you use the word commoditization at the same time, which is sort of the antithesis. I'm sorry, what one? Use the word commoditization, which is the antithesis of putting intelligence in the network. That in fact, the, the, a lot of the value of the ARPANET was to move all the intelligence to the nodes. And in fact, your service model does that, and every time to put intelligence in the network seems to fail. That's AT&T keeps trying this again and again. And the examples where we have intelligence in the network, the current uh, telephony network is uh, one of the slowest and hardest to change because of that. The, uh, another example is air traffic control, which has this completely centralized network. I think they've moved beyond tubes, but not much. And there's a movement to do free flight and move the intelligence into the planes and the endpoints. Well, the interesting thing about you know, the, the ARPANET from the point of view of any of the traditional telecommunications industry was that this was not moving the intelligence into the network. It was pushing it out to the periphery. They saw it at the boundary and in fact, um, you know, anyone who believes that their business is in value-added services in the net would see the pushing of all of that to the boundary as being the antithesis of what's a good business practice for them. Who wants to be in the business of just stringing a fiber if the only return that you can get is based on the cost of digging a ditch and, you know, and the wire that you bought? Um, so, I, I mean, I, th I also think that the idea of um, commoditization of intelligence is actually one that re we ought to come back and rethink about because I'm not sure I'm willing to accept the fact that just because intelligent behavior becomes a commodity, if we can talk about it that way, that it necessarily means it is not a useful, intelligent, or more capable function than you now have. I didn't mean, commodi I didn't mean commoditization of intelligence. Commoditization of the pipe, we move the intelligence outside the network. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, Stuart Card from Xerox PARC. Oh, what's to prevent one competitor in your open network from, from gaining enough uh, share? One what? I'm sorry? One competitor from becoming large enough that they begin introducing proprietary contents and standards into the, into the net and then moving it out of the open uh, network uh, category. Netscape's doing some of this, for, for example. Um, not only is there nothing to prevent it, in fact, I don't understand why you'd want to prevent it. <coughs> it seems to me what you want to encourage is the provision of all the goods and services that people think they want to provide. Uh, if somebody is providing something at a price, people will either pay the price or they won't pay the price, and it really depends on their needs and their alternatives or their wants and their alternatives. Uh, well, there are lots of cases today where you can get something for free and you can get essentially the same thing and pay a price. What do you get for paying the price? You may get a little more functionality, maybe not a lot, maybe just a little. You may get service, a number to call that will help you with a problem if you have it. You may get certain additional functionality that lets you do some extensibility where you didn't have it before. So I'm all in favor of allowing for proprietary um, goods and, and functions to show up in, in the network. What I would like to do is to avoid monopoly positions where you don't get the benefit of all of the uh, uh, good ideas that are around from all quarters. So that's why this notion of open architecture is so important to me. It does not preclude in my mind single organizations from providing or trying to provide a vertical stack of all the functionality they think everybody will want. And if they can get to there and they do it such that nobody else can come in in an economical way to compete, uh, you know, so much the better for them. Uh, when it's done strictly from a monopoly position and you could have better solutions by allowing some things to change, then it seems to me we have ways of dealing with that as well. Thank you very much. Terrific.